A very warm welcome to you from Equa Marketing. This presentation is brought to you by Equa.com, a leader in digital marketing. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another amazing episode of Growing Dentist Podcast Show. I'm super excited today to have Kiera Dent with me. Kiera is the founder of Kiera Dental Consulting.com. She's also the founder of DentalPlacementPros.com. Kira, welcome to Growing Dentist. Thank you. I'm so excited to be a part of this. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thanks a lot, Kira. I was doing some research, um, you know, before uh, you and I started talking and uh, just you know, learning more about you. And a few things caught my attention. Um, uh, one is your story around, you know, how you got into dentistry and how you kind of became this co-owner of a practice and, you know, helped the practice grow rapidly. And then how did things evolve over time where you got into consulting, where you started helping others, and also you started, you know, dental pro, uh, dentalplacementpros.com. So why don't you take us to, through your journey in a few minutes? So those of us uh, who don't know a lot about you kind of get an overview of who they are listening to. Absolutely. Thank you. So my journey started back in high school when I was trying to think of what career I wanted to do in uh, dental assisting came up, and I thought, why not? I get to wear scrubs, so go to work in my pajamas every day. Of course I want to do that. So it kind of started in a very ridiculous manner, but I, I found that I was absolutely passionate about what I was doing. So I was a dental assistant for a few years, and then I went to a front office and an office manager, and then my husband ended up going to pharmacy school at Midwestern University in Arizona. And I did some research and found out that if a spouse worked at the college, we could get a discount on his tuition. So naturally, I decided to look for a job. And I feel so fortunate because to get a job at Midwestern was a very hard thing to do. And I feel so fortunate that I was able to get into teaching at the in, in the dental college. So I got to work with the first and second year students. And I got to teach radiology. And I feel like um, that was a real big tipping point in my life because that network and that research and that experience really led me to where I am today. So I am always grateful for them taking, um, allowing me to come in and be a part of that amazing school. So I worked there for three years and upon graduation, there was a student and her and I decided to partner together and we went to Colorado and started some practices. So <clears throat> I became a part owner of those practices. And our first practice, I, I feel like we were two kids playing house. Um, we knew what we were doing. We both had a ton of dental experience, but to actually be owning and running a practice that was ours was crazy. We, um, we took ownership of a practice, and our building was going to be torn down. So in two months' time, we had bought another location, built it, transitioned our 4,000 patient base. They were not all active. We had about 2,000 active patients down to another location. We had transitioned our software, and we had gone from 50 new patients a month to over 100 new patients a month in that short time period. So we were having rapid, rapid growth. And, um, and then in nine short months, with doing that in the first two months, we had taken our practice from about 500000 to $2.4 million. And then we bought our second practice. So we, we had a ton of fun, and I felt like we were constantly just being – bombarded with all sorts of different things, learning to be practice owners, but it was a ton of fun and an opportunity that, once again, Midwestern and then this opportunity gave me the tools and skills to be where I am today. So after my husband finished residency, I realized that the experience I had with my friend in Colorado, I could easily go and then help all the other students that I had met through my time working at Midwestern. And I really wanted to reach out because I realized so many people need help. They need to be able to know how to get from that initial, I want to buy a practice or I want to be an associate and who do I ask these questions to? So that kind of allowed me to open up the door for my own consulting company to help people buy practices, to grow their practices. Um, Dental placement pros came about because the dean of Midwestern contacted me and said, you know, Kira, there's nowhere really for people to go um, when they're graduating from dental school to find great practices. So that became an amazing opportunity to place awesome associates into incredible practices and really good, good match with those. So it just keeps growing and evolving. I mean, I'm 
I also was able to partner with Mark Costas. We do the Dental Success Institute, and that's a ton of fun, helping tons of people. So I just really feel fortunate that through my journey, I've been able to be a part of so many dentists' lives, but also glean knowledge. Um, I feel like I'm kind of a hub of hundreds of different dental practices into one, one person that then can go out and share that information with other people. Right. I was going to ask you, um, let's focus on, you know, your time, um, you know, growing this practice rapidly. You were a co-owner. When was this, by the way? What year was this? This this was two years ago, so right after, it started in July 2015. Right, so you got involved in July 2015 and in a span of nine months, so that's uh, by July 2016, you were able to grow it from how, how much to how much? So it was um, at about July 2015 to April 2016. We grew up from about 500,000 to 2.4 million. Right. Let's kind of dissect that journey and what happened because I'm sure there are a lot of listeners who are kind of curious, how did you do that? Uh, I'm not sure that all of them want to grow that rapidly that fast, but <laughs> it's, of course, you know, interesting to learn. So let's, from a 10,000-foot level, what do you think happened? that allowed you to grow that fast? Well, I think it was uh, the girl that I was partnered with is a phenomenal dentist. Uh, she just, she's amazing and she's constantly looking for ways to grow and improve herself. So we really took on a specialty approach as well. We did everything in the office. We did implants, Invisalign, um, we did extractions. We were constantly pushing ourselves, taking CEs. I took CE with her. And then also the magic sauce is we just didn't sleep. Like we worked so hard. It was a ton of hard work to get there. Um, but then even more than that, what we impressed upon our team was that we always give exceptional dentistry and we give exceptional customer service. And that seems so basic. But so many people get wrapped up in forgetting that patients are what feed us. Patients are the ones that refer their friends to us. And if they have a great experience in your practice, they talk about you. And so we, oh gosh, all of our meetings, we're constantly focused on how can we make our practice exceptional to our patients? What can we do to, because it's all about that experience. I mean, we're constantly competing for patients. I, I've learned that you know, we all know that dentistry is a luxury. Patients don't have to come to the dentist. We have to win them over time and time and time again. So I think when you have that mentality and you remember that them coming to see you is such a privilege and opportunity, and you want to make sure that they know how much you value them, that comes back to you twofold every single time. And that was our approach. We constantly were focused on that. And, and then we just, we grew. We really grew ourselves exponentially as far as our knowledge of dentistry. I mean, the dentist and I were taking CEs left and right, always expanding and improving ourselves. And then, you know, we were, we were risky too. We we weren't afraid of we weren't afraid of failure. Failure is what pushes people to excellence. I mean, obviously, don't get into things that are over your head. We weren't doing anything crazy to where, you know, it was it wasn't safe for the patient. But um, I remember she 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 started doing root canals and. You know, we had analyzed every single root canal of how we could do better. And, you know, things happen with root canals, right? Like we've all broken files, that things have happened. But then I remember one night we were, I was talking to her and she said, man, like I'm so frustrated because this happened. And I looked at her and I said, you're better than that. And that kind of became our motto within the practice that we are better than that. We will always push ourselves to be excellent in every single possible way. Let's talk about the customer experience. And uh, I'm sure the very first day you guys got into this, you had no idea what was missing and what was going on. So I would like to understand, you know, perhaps what's the first step you took, you know, when it comes to providing that amazing customer experience because you believe that, you know, patients do not have to do dentistry. It's a luxury and it's, it's their choice and it's your job to convince them that they need it and they need it you know, need to do it with you and, you know, grow with you. So what was the first step? Let, let me understand, because a lot of times I find, you know, success is like driving at night. You only see 500 feet ahead, and then once you get there, you mm -hmm. see the next 500 feet and the next and the next. And, and really successful people get it, and they're not too focused on, 
you know, the last 500 feet, they're focused on the next and the next, and they're always, like, in the moment. So just curious. So you come in and you had this practice. So you guys bought a practice, or what happened? Correct, yes. We bought a practice, and um, and I agree with you. It did come piece by piece by piece. When we bought it, we had no clue kind of where we would be nine months later. That was not our goal at all. But when we first took over, we we learned, and I think it. The more the the more practices that I've bought, and the more I understand, the more I realize each practice comes very differently. So this is what worked for our first practice, and it didn't work for the next practice. So each one evolves, but I think some of the core basics are there with every practice. The first thing we did was assess the practice, and across the board, we realized that patient education was lacking, and. I have a strong, 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 very adamant approach that education to patients is what patients want. I've learned that whenever we go somewhere, we don't want to feel incompetent. You know, my husband's a pharmacist, and half the time he tells me things, and I have no clue what he's talking about. But if he can break it down to where I understand what he's talking about, I feel so much more confident to have that conversation with him. And that relates into dentistry of what we did is, um, we were very thorough, and we spent a lot of our time educating our patients. So first thing we did was we invested in amazing hygienists, absolutely incredible hygienists, because they were selling the dentistry for us. So we calibrated our hygienists into the the ideas and the culture of our practice. So they were, they were all following the same model. So no matter which hygienist our patients saw, uh, they would hear the same thing that our doctor would say. And that was one of the first things. We invested a lot of money into great hygienists. And then we also gave them an hour hygiene appointment. Now, we had 90 new patients a month, and some people would think, oh, my gosh, you should have done accelerated hygiene or something. But we were so firm that we believed that that hour hygiene spot gave our hygienists the time to educate our patients. When patients felt educated, I mean, we were we were teaching them about new things with PRF and gum grafting and Procedures that patients hadn't heard, you know, implants. Implants have been heard, but the understanding of those isn't there. We also made educational forms. I have information on dental implants and information about PRF and gum grafting. And so that way, a patient would learn about it in our office. Our doctor spent a lot of time educating and doing comprehensive dentistry. And then we'd send them home with that information as well. So three points of contact we made with them to give them the education that they needed to then feel confident in making those choices to come see us. Patients would tell us all the time, thank you so much for finally like diagnosing on me, for finally teaching me what I need. And I don't feel this approach will work in every practice, but across the board in all the practices I'm in, I have found that if you'll take the time to educate, to make that patient uh, feel like they're heard, to feel like you spent quality time with them, that's what that's what brings them back um, time and time and time again, and that was our first approach. So then we, we get our, our hygienist dialed in, we get our information sheets dialed in, and then the next thing we realized, we needed to have a stronger team. So we worked on finding the best assistants and the best front office that could then give our patients those experiences, and then we just worked so hard to create a culture of, excellence in everything we do. We had meetings monthly and bi- bi-monthly to talk about our culture. We had a mission statement and a vision statement, and we just dialed everybody in on the same page. So that way we were operating as smoothly as possible. Now, that I, it, the way I'm saying this sounds like we were perfect on day one, and I can promise you we made so many mistakes and so many times when I didn't know how we were going to get our way out of a mess. But it, it's all, like you said, a growth in progress. And, you know, you learn one thing and then you continue to make that better and better and better to where then you are like, wow, we are making a difference. Um, we also did community outreach. We felt it was important to give back to the community. And so we let our patients know. And that was a huge driving force for us as well. Is And we just tried a bunch of different things. I mean, we would try certain things with our team and they would flop. It would just be a fail. I remember I tried so many different incentive programs, and a lot of them failed. And we tried, like, just different ways to present treatment to our patients, and those would fail. So it was constantly learning and evolving, but not being afraid to fail, but instead using those moments of, you know, if they didn't accept our $20,000 treatment plan, 
what kind of training do we need to become better? And then as leaders, we took all those falls on ourselves. We owned all of those mistakes. Um, if if we didn't have acceptance on treatment, I didn't I didn't say it was, oh, that girl did not do a good job on her treatment plan. No, that was me not educating them or training them or teaching them or giving them the tools. And I think when you have leaders that own that every mistake that happens within a practice falls on the leader, your team, your team follows you. You have a cohesive team, and that then goes into patients. So. It's amazing. I mean, there's so many pieces of things you said. I, I want to pass, but let me start by, um, you know, talking about that uh, education piece because I think that's something interesting there. Uh, of course, you made a bunch of key points. One is, you know, making people feel like they're being heard. It's not about you and what you want to do to them. It's about you helping them achieve their dreams, achieve their hopes, achieve, solve their problems, right? Um, can you can you talk a little bit more about that phase of the relationship? Like you know, like I would love to kind of learn from you and you know be a fly in the wall and kind of see how that conversation goes. Sure, absolutely. So we we were really big on education. I think when a student comes right out of school at the forefront of their mind, and this isn't saying that only students are this way. I just think from my perspective and the experience I had, the dentist coming right out of school was very pro-education. And so we spent a lot of time, but we didn't just educate our patients. We also made sure that our whole team was educated on the procedures we were doing. Because if everybody on our team was educated and knew, then we could speak intelligently to our patients and answer the questions they had. But when when you go into a treatment plan, we, you know, the doctor that I worked with was amazing, and I loved her approach with patients. She always addressed herself by her first name and would get down to their level. And I feel she instantly was able to connect with patients on that on that way. But then, what she did beyond that was our hygienist we really made sure that they dialed in and a lot of offices do this, but we, we made sure that we figured out the patient's number one concern because whenever we go somewhere, we typically have an agenda. Um, just as human nature, we, we know what we want. We know the things that bother us. And so whatever that patient's concern was, our approach was we would address that, making sure that they knew that they had been heard and that we were going to work with that. However, we also gave them a comprehensive treatment plan because, and sometimes those can be overwhelming. You know, we definitely have to dial in how to educate them and how to, how to do it. But we made sure that when, we always let the patient know what was going on. So we first met the patient. We would, you know, listen to their concerns. Then we'd say, you know, we're going to call out some numbers and then we'll explain what we just talked about with our, with our hygienist. So then we would go through and do the whole comprehensive exam, listing off all the treatment needed but then come back to the front to face the patient again and go over and say, you know, hey, we just listed off a bunch of treatment. We want to explain why this treatment is necessary, where it is, showing them the x-rays. And now this might sound like it was a very long process, and it doesn't need to be because your hygienist has already prepped them on a lot of these, these items. But it was more just the patient understands then treatment is easily closed at the front. We used to have a saying that if, if we didn't close a treatment plan, nine times out of ten, it was because we failed to educate in the back. So we needed to do better educating in the back office. And when we educate them, I mean, and we just broke it down into simple terms. We made it very easily digestible to the patient to where when they left our office, they could go tell all their friends exactly what was going to happen to them. So when they came back for their appointment, they knew exactly what was going to happen. We spelled it out in detail for them because then, they don't, they're, it, it eliminates the anxiety. It allows them to know exactly what's going to happen, what they should expect. And then at that point, after all that's explained, they're on board. They were, they were ready to get the treatment done. They were so excited. And then the last thing is you go for money. And money, there are several ways that we would, we would work through that because I felt like if they were educated and they were on board and they wanted it done, then our job was to find a solution in the front to let that happen. And that's what we just do time and time and time again but really dialing into one, what were their needs, two, how can we address those needs, and three, educating them to make sure that they felt like they knew exactly what was going to happen to the point where they could tell their friends and family. Then we knew we had done our job. Right. 
Yeah, makes sense. Um, you talked about education, and I think I, I understand what you meant by being heard. Um, there's a great state um, in a quote from Stephen Covey, right? He said, first try to understand and then try to be understood. So first listen to them and their needs and then help them understand your perspective on what more they need. Because nobody will listen to you till they feel like you understand them, till they feel like you are they are at the center of you know your universe and you are there to treat them. So I think that sounds such a simple thing, but I think a lot of dentists miss that. They're like, oh, yeah, 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 I see all these big problems that the person doesn't see. So let me focus on the big problems versus for the patient, whatever the problem they see is the biggest problem. So um, the only way to gain that credibility with the patient who just met you, you know, maybe a few minutes ago or a few days ago is to focus on them. Second thing that you mentioned that caught my attention is uh, you talked about simplicity and the language you use. So it's so like crystal clear what they are going to get and how they are going to get it, meaning they, they are very clear. There's no ambiguity. There's no uncertainty. There's no fear. Like, Can you talk a little bit more? Like, give me some examples. Like, um, How were things happening before you guys got involved and figured all of this stuff out versus how did it happen afterwards uh, in terms of how you communicated? Like, if you can give me some examples, that'll be like really help people understand. Absolutely. Um, and yes, just to tie into what you said, I love that you pointed out that nobody really cares what we have to say until they feel that they've been heard by us. So, just to double back on that, I, I absolutely agree and want to put my plug in on that as well. Um, to go forward, though, with the examples, so before the practice had been operating, like you said, you know, come in, say that this is the treatment that needs to be done. But I found that a lot of times dentists in this practice and in practices across the nation that I'm in, a lot of times we come in with a perceived perception, you know, oh, this patient can't afford this or, oh, this patient, I don't really want to diagnose all these crowns because they're going to think that I need all these crowns. And we were very pro that we do not, or, you know, the other excuse I hear is, oh, you know, they, they don't have insurance, so we're not going to do this, or they max out on insurance. And we were not that office. We we diagnosed based on what the patient needed. And, you know, if they needed five crowns, we made sure they knew why. And that to where it they weren't it wasn't even an issue. They could see it on the film. We we explained it to them, we explained how we were going to do it. So some examples. One thing we did that had not been done in the office before were same day crowns. And so I made sure that our hygienists would prep them before we came in. And then when the doctor came in, they were told, you know, you need this crown done. We're going to do an in-office crown. It means you get it done the same day. You'll come in. We'll get you numb. We'll prep the tooth for a crown. We'll scan it. You'll be able to see it if you want. It's very, very cool to see us design your own crown. Then we mill it in the office. It takes about 30 minutes. And then we'll seed it. During those 30 minutes, you'll be able to get coffee. You can sit in the waiting room. And then we'll put it in for you, and you can leave the same day with that crown. Then what we did is when they went up to the front office, our office would then once again reiterate it to the patient. You know, oh, my gosh, we're so excited. You know, this crown is going to be great. We're going to schedule you for about an hour and a half. It takes us this much time to scan it. You know, be prepared. Bring a magazine if you want, and we'll, we'll be able to see it the same day for you. So they just had three points of contact. We explained it to them. So now when they go home, they'll be like, oh, hey, sweetie, I'm going in and I'm getting a crown. Most people aren't that chipper about a crown, but the point is that they would be able to say, yeah, I'm going to go into the dentist. They're going to scan it with this cool scanner. They're going to mill it in the office. I'm going to have about 30 minutes, so, you know, I can talk to you during that time, or I need to make sure I take a book with me, and then I'm going to come home with my permanent crown. They then were able to explain to their friends what were going to happen, and we we made it exciting for them. I had so many patients that wanted to watch us scan their tooth and design their tooth in the operatory. Another example of educating was PRF. PRF, I'm obsessed with it. I think it is the coolest procedure where we draw the blood, we separate the red and white blood cells, and we use those white blood cells that, um, in a membrane form, and it actually attracts and brings all the, we would say, the healthy um, blood cells up there to regenerate um, gum tissue. It, it heals the area. So if we're doing an implant, we use it. 
but we explained it very simply. You know, we're going to draw two vials from your arms and make sure you, you come eating well so you're well fed, and then we're going to separate them out. It's a very simple process. We can show you if you'd like to see it, but, you know, this is something that helps promote growth and tissue regeneration, and, you know, we had pictures to show them the before and afters of patients that had done it in the past. So then, and then once again, hygienist starts, doctor does it, and then front office says it. So they hear it three different times to where they then know exactly what's going to happen when they come in. Um, and, and then when they come in for their appointment, our assistants would say, okay, today, you know, we're going to do that crown. Do you have any questions? And most of the time the patients would be like, nope, I know you guys are going to do it this way. You're going to take a scan. And then I get a hangout for about 30 minutes and then you'll put it in for me. So they already knew we had answered their questions. They felt educated. And patients, when they know the step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step of what's going to happen, they are so much more at ease and much more accepting of treatment when you can break it down in those simple steps. We didn't go into the nitty-gritty of everything possible that's going to go on, but it was those basic simple steps so that way they knew the process. Right. So why do you think that worked on a psychological level? Why do you think uh, versus, I mean, the old approach, what was, you know, what, what was the psychological reason why, you know, this converted and your practice grew so massively? I think the biggest thing, like I, I touched on briefly, is as a society as a whole, I've found that people want to feel educated. People don't like to feel inept. They don't like to feel like they're unintelligent. They like to feel like they know what's going on. Um, and so by us giving them those tools and that knowledge, they were then able to speak very, very intelligently about the procedures that were going to happen. And I feel when people take that ownership, now it's not us just telling them what's going to happen. They had ownership. They knew. They, they had become almost experts of what was going to go on to the point that they then felt much more confident in us, much more confident in the procedure that was going to happen. And I feel when people feel educated and have confidence, you get that acceptance, you get that loyalty, you get that. And then also another key piece in this that is said all the time, if people like you, they come back. And so we just made it a point to be that extra likable office that, that it was a pleasant experience. And I think those three items, you know, helping them to feel intelligent, giving them the confidence, and then being likable, those three pieces were like our secret sauce to success. You know, I love that. I mean, and I, I, it makes ton of sense to me. One is, um, you know, growing their confidence, right? At the end of the day, um, that's really important. And we'll talk about it a little bit, little bit more. And then you mentioned, um, you know, being the office that they like, because we all tend to, you know, go back to the restaurant we like, you know, as opposed to the one where people are rude or people are not as nice as the other one, right? Now, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and uh, she was telling me that she used to go to this one gym for four years, and after a while, she stopped going, and I said, why? And she's like, well, they still ask me for my card. I mean, I wish they know me by now, right? And yeah. if I'm a nobody to them, I'm just a number, then why am I going back? And the other place, I love it, because one week I don't go, they're like, hey, what happened to you? Is everything okay? And, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they, they know you, and they kind of almost care for you, right? So, and I think in this time and age, you know, where, you know, we are talking more and more to computers than to each other, whether it's, you know, finding directions to go somewhere on Google Maps or, you know, talking to Siri about something or, you know, um, even our bank loans, you know, humans don't approve them anymore. It's an algorithm that's approving, right, or Google search, you name it. I think that little interaction we have with each other where we are treated as humans, I think matters a lot to us. I mean, as opposed to even when you call on the customer service line, a lot of times you're talking to a computer, you're not talking to a person. So I do think... Absolutely. Um, right? And, uh, yeah, so I do think that, you know, that liking and, and is important. And the last piece you mentioned, uh, the first piece you mentioned is um, people, when they feel educated, they 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 they, they feel empowered. Like, I guess, again, it comes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for example, right? I mean, most of us 100 years ago probably would have spent most of our time, you know, worrying about how do we have food to eat for the day, you know? But today, most of us don't even spend 10% of our time worrying about the basic needs. It's kind of, you know, 
a small piece of you know our expenses, right? I mean, food and so forth. Um, as opposed to 100 years ago, maybe we all were you know working on a field or doing something from dawn to dusk, you know, working really really hard just to have a meal to eat. Uh, so I think um, so. What you see instead is because we have all this discretionary income where we can choose to spend it at Starbucks or choose to spend it at a book or a movie, all these extra things we really don't need, but we choose to have. I think people are exercising that choice, and I guess, again, internet played a role in it where there's so much information available so we can make those choices on our own. So I think what you're saying is that dentistry is no different. You know, uh, it's this you know, black box. They don't understand it. Maybe they read a few things here, a few things there, but when you are the practice where they uh, explain, you know, you explain things to them and help them, you know, feel confident about making that choice um, and and owning that choice as if it's their choice as opposed to, you know, your choice where you think they need this versus, you know, this is what's good for them and how can they get it for their own sake, right? So it flips the whole thing. Now it becomes their decision as opposed to your decision and they want it. And I guess that's a very interesting insight, those three insights. Can you say those three insights again, please? Yes, um, I said helping them feel educated so they feel intelligent on the subject, which then builds confidence in them knowing the procedure and in us doing the procedure for them and then being a likable office where they want to come. I found that a lot of patients would come in for second opinions and if and they're seeking out because they didn't fully feel educated. Now this is a blanket statement and it's not 100% accurate, but I do feel that if we could educate them, give them supporting documents in the office, Nine times out of ten, those patients did not go and research what we said. But if they did go research anything that we talked about, our facts were consistent and they would find the same things if they went and researched. That backed us as being confident that we knew what we were talking about. We knew the procedure would go the way planned to where it wasn't. I didn't have patients not showing up for their appointments because they had already solidified that decision in their mind before they left the office. Right. When we talk about confidence can can we talk more about it so what you're saying is you want their confidence to grow in the practice you want their confidence to grow in uh, the solution that you're proposing and it, they see it as their solution and they understand it and the more they understand it the more they believe in it um absolutely correct right and um, so you're saying it's not like a one shot thing it's like a sequence of things i mean you talked about the multiple touch points and how each touch point is critical in growing that confidence. So it's not like, oh, I come here and I talk to you for 10 minutes and all of a sudden, you know, I'm signing a check. That's not how people work. It's it's those series of steps, include involving your hygienist, involving the different people and all the documentation and all the other things you give to them. So when they go home, they can again reinforce that. Is that what you feel felt was kind of critical for you? You know, just those connecting the dots in terms of growing confidence? For sure. Uh, I see practices all the time right now where the doctor says one thing and then the patient's taken up front and the front office cannot cannot even explain the procedure to the patient. Well, instantly you will have lost confidence. There is that disconnect. But if you can carry that flow from back office to front office and then back to back office where every single team member is speaking the same language, they're telling you exactly, they can answer the questions consistently the same, that builds confidence. There's not that chaos. There's not that confusion. There's not that wishy-washy. It's very, very crystal clear. But that comes from educating your team to where they can confidently talk to the patient. And then the patient feels confidence in you that your office has their stuff together, that they know that what you just told them is what's going to happen. If you slip and you have that disconnect, then you start to have the, well, do I really want to pay for this? Do I really want to schedule? Do I really, um, I'm going to think about this because it feels like you don't know what's really going on. It's that constant, you've got to have consistency amongst the, all team members because that's what builds the confidence. You're, you're put together. I mean, you think of going to anywhere else, like restaurants, anywhere where it feels chaos, you are wondering, like, do they even know what they're doing here? Like, right. or, is, or are they going to mess up on me? It's all those little checkpoints, so you educate them, but then also you build the confidence to where, like, they've made their decision in the back. They're educated, they're dialed in, and then you just keep it going, flow clear to the front to where they leave, and then when they come back, 
And if you can maintain that, those patients are golden and they just keep coming back over and over. Like money, I shouldn't say this across the board, but we didn't have, I mean, I would sell 20, 30, $40,000 cases constantly. And money wasn't an issue because when people have confidence and they made that decision, they, they're not as concerned to give the money to you because they know their money is being well invested. Right, right. Talking about the last point you made, likability, of course, you know, listening to what they want and making them feel listened to and catering to that first is one way to get them to like you, right? We all like those who care about us, right? So, you know, when they feel listened to and cared for, they like you. Any other things you did in your practice to get people to like you or the practice? Yes, we were not your traditional office in the slightest. Um, The doctor had a mohawk. She had tattoos. And uh, we definitely tamed down our music a little, but we used to listen to, like, I'm not exaggerating, Fetty Wap and Drake in the ops. And that might come across, we were in downtown Denver, so some of the listeners might think I'm crazy, but the point was, we were different. We stood out differently. Um, There was something about us, and we were unique to our own style. We treatment planned on our own style. We were very much authentic to us, and patients feel that. So whoever you are, embrace it. Our practice, it exemplified who we were on all aspects, from our music to our treatment plans to the way we all looked. I mean, we had a certain look. We had a certain logo. We were very much, we were impressionable. I mean, people would talk about our office all the time. Like, we found out we were in comedy shows in Denver. We found out so many different things about us. Um, And I think it was because we were authentic. We weren't afraid to be our own office. And people like that. I mean, next. We all know what a dentist office like typically feels like. And for some offices, they're probably thinking Fetty Wap and Drake is absolutely absurd. And frankly, <laughs> there were times when we had older patients that were like, oh, my gosh, we need to turn this down. But I feel like because we were authentic, people could feel the good vibes between us as team members. We had a good office. And then I think it was because we were authentic to ourselves and that made us likable. We were genuine in who we were as an office. We were authentic to who we were. and and we did our thing, and we did it really, really, really well. We were experts in our field, and we did our dentistry exceptionally well. Right. So you don't have to be like them. You have to be you. Absolutely. hundred percent. I cannot drive that point home enough. I go into practices constantly, and they're like, well, I heard about this practice, and I heard about this practice, and I want to try this. And absolutely, do things that you hear. Like, it's a wealth of knowledge out there. But number one is if you're authentic and genuine to who you are, Patients see that, they feel that, they like you because that's who you are. And, you know, we, that was, that's what made us successful. That's what, that was the difference between us and several other offices. Offices are the same across the board. You know, you can walk into most dental offices and it's very consistent. So be you, be genuine, be authentic. People love that. People love authentic, genuine people because that's very scarce in today's society. Normally we're trying to fit a mold. We're trying to be exactly what we think people want to be instead of really becoming our own person. And that's another area I feel set us apart from other offices. Let me ask you this. When it comes to different generations, uh, did you, like in this first practice you're talking about, was it like a certain demographic or was it across the board or was it heavily concentrated in certain demographics? We were in Denver. So we did have a a diverse culture within. However, we had primarily older patients. So we had several older patients, but then we were able to draw in the younger crowd. But I mean, we didn't cater. And sometimes we felt like our music might be a little crazy and rambunctious. And, you know, we would accommodate the older patients for that. But we still stayed authentic to who we were as a practice. And it didn't turn off the older patients. I mean, the fact that you guys had tattoos didn't turn off the older No, because, I mean, there were for sure some that did not care for a doctor who had a very extreme style. Um, But overall, most patients loved her. They loved us. Why? Because we made their experience memorable. We went above and beyond, and we gave them exceptional dentistry. We dialed into their needs and their concerns. We really approached all those different things we've talked about. And patients, I mean, across the board, most of them, that's what they're looking for. So they don't really care about those external vibes. If they feel good when they're in there, when they talk to you, 
they come back. So no, we did not lose very many patients at all. Like any generation, we did not, I, we didn't, we we're, I mean, I tracked our attrition rate and our attrition rate, we maintained across the board 80%. We were not losing patients at all. It was very few that we lost. Right, right. Um, this thing about education, right, because you felt that is one of the reasons, like you felt when people feel um, educated and feel like they are in control, they're knowledgeable, they tend to say yes. Uh, again, is that something that you found maybe uh, specific to one generation, or did you find that also across the board? I find it across the board. Like I said, that we're we're dialing in on one practice that I was in. However, I'm in multiple practices. I'm in over 40 practices right now currently. And across the board, I can tell you, no matter what generation it is, I think it does lean a little bit more, to more towards millennials-ish. But I say that loosely because also older generations want to feel educated. Every single generation wants to feel educated. I feel that that is a general need um, for most patients. And I'm talking, we're talking HMO, PPO, fee-for-service, you name it across the board. People don't like to feel dumb. People don't like to feel like they don't know what's going on. Uh, and they want to feel safe to ask those questions. But the best practices are those that have answered the questions before they even need to be asked. And so really educating and letting that patient know exactly what's going on, I don't see there ever being from one generation to another them accepting or not accepting. I feel like just across the board from my own experience and all the practices I'm in, that educational piece, if you can dial it in in a way that's simple, patients gravitate towards you. Yeah, and I cannot emphasize enough this idea of, you know, being listened to. I think that's such a big thing. I remember taking my mom uh, to an ophthalmologist, and it's like a factory, and, you know, so many people get to see, and finally the doc walks in for, like, literally 45 seconds, and she asked a question. He's like, no, you got to go and see somebody else for that. Of course, you know, he could have answered that, but mm -hmm. he just didn't, you know, he didn't realize there was a human being sitting on the other side. I mean, it's almost like... You know, he's working on this box almost. You know, it's like no emotions, no feelings, nothing. And mm -hmm. uh, and people, you know, I mean, I've told told that story like 25 times. I mean, you know, he could be the best mm -hmm. freaking ophthalmologist in the world, but, you know, it doesn't really matter. You know, it really doesn't matter how great he is, you know, scientifically or technically or whatever. If you can't, you know, connect to that human being on the other side. And I think maybe that, you know, even though your 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 doctor was crazy and had tattoos, but I guess she could connect to people on a human level, and she could listen to them and make them feel heard, and not just her, but the entire practice, right? So it was just teamwork. No, and well, uh, the other part, it, which I kind of agree with, is consistency. I think that's also so powerful. Like you know, if one person says one thing and the other doesn't, people lose confidence in you know very quickly. Or even if they say it, but they say it differently, they lose confidence. So I think consistency is so important. Like you know, like you said, you start thinking maybe they don't have the act together. Maybe the doctor is great, but maybe the team is not. A hundred percent. We talked about that a lot. And um, we we'd see other offices, and they would say, you know, I love the dentist, but the front office, I just could not stand them. So I switched dentists, and we're like, whoa, that's awful. And we realized dentistry is crazy because patients do not know. Ninety percent of the time, they don't know if you're a good dentist or a bad dentist. They don't know. All they know is how do they feel? How are you? How are you as a dentist? They don't know. They don't know if you did a great filling or a bad filling. They have no clue, generally speaking. They know if it hurts, but all they know is if they like you or don't like you. So it's so important to be impressionable in a positive way, to be consistent and to educate them because those make them feel something. It makes them feel good. It makes them feel like they know what's going on. It makes them feel confident. All those feelings that's all they know. They don't know if it's a good dentist or a bad dentist. They only know how they feel. Right. Absolutely. I, I totally hear you. You know, I can keep talking to you about this forever, and I, I think you're very smart, and I think, you know, you kind of zoomed into the important stuff. And I'm so impressed by the fact that, you know, um, you, you've learned so much so quickly and continue to learn so much. So that's awesome. Um, maybe I would like to have you come back at some other point, maybe to talk about 
you know, hiring and things like that. I, I wish I could do that today, but I, I think we won't do justice if, uh, you know, we try to cover that also because I think we should go deep. Um, a- any other thoughts you have for our listeners? I think a final one, and I appreciate you, and I'd love to come back again another time because there are so many things that I feel people can dial into, but I love that we've dug deep. And so the final thought um, is be you. And that sounds so simple, but truly be authentic and genuine to you. As we've dug deeper into this and I relived my journey of this, I really have dialed in and hope people have felt and realized that at the end of the day, being you, being authentic to you will make you happier. Being happier in your office is going to attract more patients to you. It's going to have a better vibe in your practice. Educating them, just kind of summarizing everything we've talked about today. But the number one thing I think is be authentic and be true to you. When you love what you do, when you're passionate about what you do, when you're in your zone in your office of being you and you've got your team operating just like you are and you're really dialing into your patients, patients feel that. That's what they go home and remember. And like you said, treating them like people, not like numbers. Those things pay undue dividends time and time and time again. And that is what will make you a successful practice. Right. Yeah, I mean, this is an amazing podcast. I really enjoyed it. If somebody wants to learn more about you and and uh, maybe even consult with you and get your tips on, you know, some of their challenges, like how can they get a hold of you, uh, Kira? Absolutely. Um, I have two different methods. There's the kirasdentalconsulting.com, and that's K-I-E-R-A-S, it's plural, kirasdentalconsulting.com or Dental Placement Pros, again, plural, dot com, or they can even call or text me at 801-885-5351. Any of those three ways, I'm always happy. Shoot me an email. It's kirasdentalconsulting at gmail.com or dentalplacementpros at gmail.com. Any of those methods, there are contact forms. I would love to talk to people, brainstorm ideas, because the world of dentistry is is our playground. It's the area we all get to create and become and learn from each other. So thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed our chat today. And, you know, you are a wealth of knowledge. And I think you have that um, that spirit of giving and, you know, helping people. And like you said, being you. So I think that comes across. You know, you're not trying to be anybody else. You're following your heart and your passion. And I think uh, it's awesome, you know, to see you do that and uh, hopefully help others do the same. I really appreciate you coming to our show today and sharing your knowledge with so many people listening all across the world and all across the U.S. and Canada. Perfect. Thank you again. Once again, thank you everyone for listening to an amazing episode of Growing Dentist Podcast Show with Kiera Dent. And you can reach her at Kiera's dentalconsulting.com and we will uh, include her contact information in the show notes.